Hello, and welcome to another fascinating episode of What to Think, Venture Beats podcast, uh, hosted and sponsored by New Relic. We have got a doozy of a roster of stories for you today. It was kind of a big week. We've been going through the summer doldrums. Executives are on vacation. VCs are doing what they do best, lounging and day drinking. Mm -hmm. And so um, we kind of had to look around, dig up a few meaty stories to keep ourselves entertained. And boy, (laughs) did we deliver, if I may say, as managing editor of VentureBeat.com, I was very impressed. I'm Jolie O'Dell, by the way. And I'm Jordan Novet. No, you go. You do your thing. I'm a staff writer and Julie is the managing editor. That means I'm your boss-ish. Yes, yes it's ish. absolutely true. Okay. Great boss. Well, yeah, good. Make sure you kiss my butt a whole lot during this, <laughs> this episode. So, Jordan, what do you say we start off with Twitter earnings? They had their earnings this week. Oh, my gosh. 33% up after the stock market closed. Um, and I think... It was really impressive uh, to see so many people using Twitter, possibly growing at a faster rate than Facebook is. And well, it might anything be... can grow faster when it's smaller. Fine. But in terms of the World Cup, uh, we were talking about this a few weeks ago. That's people true. really went there and the discussion wasn't so much on Facebook. Well, I would argue that measuring discussion on Twitter is different because people will tweet and tweet and tweet multiple times, mm-hmm. but they're a little more cautious on Facebook because they don't want to bore people. Whereas on Twitter, everybody's bored. I'm mm-hmm. bored. <laughs> well, I, I think the bigger point is that actually Twitter is looking more like a legitimate investment vehicle. Oh, I don't know about that. The come feds on, said not a couple weeks ago that you should not invest in social media company stock, including Twitter. So if I'm not, I think I'm not legally allowed to give investment advice, but I'm just saying I, the way I feel, I would be shorting Twitter hard right now. Wow. I, I see. I, I'm i just a negative Nancy. Yeah, I'm a Debbie are. Downer. I'm much more of an upper on this one. I, I think watch for that stock to really keep going up. I think people are, are going to continue to use it for a long ass time. I foresee doom. Fine. And we can't put money on this because we can't <laughs> invest. So Right. We can't. Let's put dinner on it. If Twitter stock in three months doesn't plummet then I will buy you dinner. Okay, fine. Uh, I'm Fancy always hungry. So. steakhouse dinner. Damn. Because okay. I really believe in this. And if if I win, you have to buy me... What kind of dinner? Diamonds. Whoa, that's kind of unfair. That's a little that's bit too much. how right I'm I am. I'm only a writer. Okay. So the, the <laughs> company did double down on its ad revenues over the past quarter. Mm-hmm. And we had a really interesting kind of insidery story about how Twitter is opening up new revenue streams and new business opportunities by buying up mobile companies yep. in areas where it previously encouraged developers and third parties to innovate. For example, I specifically remember Dick Costolo saying a couple years ago, yeah, if you want to start a data analysis business around Twitter, go for it. We are not going to do you know, analytics, we are not going to do data licensing. And Mm. what did they do? They They bought bought GNIP. They bought GNIP for the data licensing. And then they went out and bought a bunch of mobile analytics companies. Mm -hmm. So Dick Costello, if you're listening and you're not, but if you're listening, I would strongly urge you to take a truth pill next time you want to talk to investors and press about the company's future. Then again, they could have just changed their minds. But I take it as in the most offensive light. Okay, that's a fair comment on their community. Well, because when you do that, you kill people's businesses, you kill their livelihoods, and you destroy two, three, four years of work on a project. Fine. Debbie Downer, reporting. I'm going to jump in and say the latest thing with Twitter that we saw last week and that we wrote about today is that they bought a deep learning startup that has computer vision knowledge. So expect picture um, recognition to go through the roof, kind of like how Facebook has been doing. This guy who actually Facebook hired last year named Jan LeCun, he's an awesome guy in deep learning, uh, which we'll talk about later, by the way, actually had a couple of students who started this startup called Mad Lib or something. Uh, I should know this. But anyway, they just got bought by Twitter. And I think that's going to be potentially the start of like a deep learning team at Twitter. I'm really excited to see about how that turns out. You know, this is a perfect segue. I had the distinct pleasure 
of editing a Jordan Novet scoop <laughs> on deep learning. First uh-huh. of all, explain exactly what deep learning is. Sure. Okay. Uh, you have 40 billion pictures of snapshots taken from YouTube. Uh, you'd be right in thinking that there'd be a lot of cat pictures. And so gradually over time, the system that's analyzing all those pictures will say, you know what, I see ears and I see a cute little nose and I see beady eyes, that might be a cat. So it first picks up different features of those pictures and then it's able to get thrown a whole new picture and say, that's a cat, I recognize from all those pictures. That inference drawing is basically one kind of deep learning. So that is the answer to your deep learning uh, explanation. Now, the interview would, you did was with Andrew. How do you pronounce his last name? Ing. Andrew Ing. He used to be at Google. He was their guru, their, their shaman. Mm-hmm. Let's call him a shaman of he, deep learning. Fine. He created the Google Brain Project, which actually did that very thing of analyzing a crap load of cat pictures and starting to be able to generate a cat on its own. Pretty amazing. And so he left that, he started Coursera, actually. He helped start Coursera. And now he's back doing that really nerdy, awesome stuff uh, that Microsoft and IBM and even Pinterest and other web companies, and Facebook too, uh, have been getting in on. So my premise is you need to watch out for Baidu, even though they're only in four languages, they're adding deep learning into many, many kinds of apps very quickly. Yeah, I think Baidu is one to watch. Mm-hmm. I mean, they they have deep deep roots into parts of the global economy that American powerhouse companies haven't been able to touch. Mm -hmm. Just look at Google's failure in China. That's right. They're actually number two in the world. Just, I think, honestly, by virtue of their success in China. Baidu? Baidu, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think when you come to things from um, an American cultural perspective, Mm -hmm. you kind of lose out on a lot of global markets. Can I give you another example? Please do. We had another scoop, another scoop interview. The chief and founder of Viber. Mm -hmm. It's this uh, IM VoIP app. 400 million users in four years. And you've never heard of them. No, I have. Actually, they've they've been popular here in the past one or two years. Let's be fair. Some people use it. I've never heard of it. And I'm old enough to know better. (laughs) Maybe. You crazy kids with your Tinder and your Viber and your Grindr. (laughs) That is not a comment on Jordan Novet's sexual preferences, but if it were true, I would not judge him in the slightest and we would be gay besties. This is off topic. Let's get back to it. So Viber, they came in as kind of a Skype competitor Mm -hmm. and they wiped it out in like the Middle East and other locations around the world. And they're being used by both sides of this crazy you know, political mess in Syria and Iraq and Israel and Palestine. So one question is, what about all those other um, messaging services, WhatsApp? Did Rich actually find anything out about whether people are using WhatsApp or uh, what's the other one? Yes, people are using WhatsApp. I can, my independent anonymous sources confirm that people do use WhatsApp. (laughs) I'm a reporter, so. (laughs) But what about in all these war-torn places that Rich was talking about? That, um, I would assume, yes, but we'll talk to Rich later and find out. Yeah, let's ask him. Okay, we will. Finally, BlackBerry, never thought I'd mention that name, had their security summit this past week, this week. And um, I think BlackBerry, they're really grasping at straws. And they're trying (laughs) to say, hey, everybody, security is the new buzzword and uh, Mm oh yeah we do security Mm -hmm. on our phones um they've kind of (laughs) yeah we do doesn't what the hell Uh, like i said they're grasping at buzzwords oh my gosh and yeah they made a play for developers back a couple years ago when developers were like the hot new thing but they they basically admitted at this summit that they're thinking about the internet of things of course they are buzzword and security another buzzword and byod of course Right. Actually, this quote, they, they probably uh, the inter- sanctioned a whole bunch of those uh, oh. BlackBerry phones, whereas BYOD really means people are bringing their freaking Android right. and iPhones right. in. And there's this quote from the president of the Enterprise Unit. Let me tell you, the Internet of Things is BYOD on steroids. Oh, please. Does that even make sense? Is that even true? No, I don't want to deal with it. I Okay, let's just take that quote and the person Crumple it up, please. Yes, and nothing but net that crap into the garbage can exactly. Great of idea. journalism. I'm down with it. But they did basically admit during this summit that 
BlackBerry is no longer, they no longer have any hope or desire to be a consumer brand. When did they actually ever have that desire? Did they? Yeah, totally. Is there con- I, back in 20, oh, no, wait, 2009, I had a BlackBerry Storm, the single most frustrating phone I've ever owned. It died when I threw it against a wall. <laughs> And I was only a little bit drunk. <laughs> what about the other phones you've done that with? How have they put up with your, uh, your the fierceness? throwing? That was the only phone I've ever gotten mad enough to throw, and it was <laughs> so bad. And I think somewhere around that era, BlackBerry was like, "Oops, we don't understand consumer technology. Let's just focus on the big bucks in the enterprise." So, so there it is. And as previously mentioned, we are going to bring on. One of our favorite reporters, Venture Beat's investigative journalist, Rich Riley. He's kind of a fireball. He's almost frightening to talk to. He's so wired and and he's so connected. He gets to talk to people where you're like, what? You talk to the former director of the KGB? Sure. Okay. Thanks, Rich. (laughs) Um, And he gives us some of our biggest scoops. But before we do that, Quick thanks to our host and sponsor, New Relic, a software analytics company that makes sense of billions of metrics across millions of web and mobile apps. New Relic helps the people who build modern software understand the stories their data is trying to tell them. When software breaks, everyone loses. New Relic helps improve software performance and reliability, delivering a better experience for users and more success for your business. New Relic supports PHP, Python, Ruby, Java, .NET, Node, iOS and Android apps. That's wonderful. Yes. Thank you, New Relic. And thank you, Jordan. Thank you, Jolie. <laughs> well, you're welcome. <laughs> now, on that note, drum roll, please. Okay, softer drum roll. That was out, out of line. Okay, no drum roll. Okay. If you're going to do it, do it two fingers. Now, we bring on Venture Beats investigative reporter, Rich Riley, my friend. Our investigative jewel at VentureBeat.com, internet website. How are you today? I am doing good. Can you guys hear me? You sound beautiful. Wonderful. Clear as a church bell. So we wanted to talk to you about, we've already uh, talked behind your back about one of your other scoops from this week, but I want to talk to you most especially about the reporting you did on the Yahoo Flurry deal, because you got some insider information there. You know, it's what I covet. It's the fly on the wall approach as every good reporter uh, endeavors himself to. So the sourcing was incredibly tight. When you say sourcing, who did you who did you talk to for this? Do you want their names and social securities or numbers or no? <laughs> no, I just want the credit card numbers. I have some online shopping to do. <laughs> but um, no, so these were anonymous sources at, at Yahoo or Flurry? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they they exist more on the uh, without giving too much away, you know, at the executive level uh, and uh, uh, people that that, uh, you know, are in inside of the company and externally as well. So there was more than just the two quoted in, in the story, but I was able to get the real gist of some of the machinations that were transpiring within Flurry leading up to the sale. And, you know, if you read the piece, you, you can ascertain pretty accurately that uh, Flurry was lucky in this case. So now how exactly were they, how did they get lucky and what was their fate if they hadn't gotten lucky? That's a great question, Jolie. The fate is like my article said, uh, uncertain, but what is certain is that flurry, uh, which I understand had a hundred million dollar year last year <clears throat> was running low on cash. Uh, the main cash hole that revenue was going into was was maintaining their their vast server farms, which holds the crown jewels of the company, their analytics data. As the piece pointed out, one of my sources that the cost of, of operations was was quickly uh, outstripping the revenue. So that's why they took that twenty million dollar debt loan to keep the company afloat. So, Rich, this is Jordan. I am just wondering how that is different from a lot of other companies. I mean, a lot of other companies basically run at a loss. And I just wonder um, what makes this one different from a lot of other, you know, venture backed uh, startups. That's a great question. The company is over 10 years old. Right. Mm -hmm. And for a company to be going and feeding at the troughs of the venture capitalists uh, last year, for example, Mm -hmm. um, for another twelve and a half million dollars. Uh, is a, is a real indication that I mean you need money to grow, but but they but they were were you know increasingly becoming desperate because if they didn't have these infusions of venture money and then that debt loan, 
uh, or they didn't get bought by Yahoo, how are they going to keep keep up their doors open, right? Mm-hmm. Now, let me ask you, Jordan, our big data reporter, how is it that servers were their number one money hole? Like, it seems like in this day and age, infrastructure should be a lot cheaper than that. It shouldn't be your main cost. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. Some people are just plain old idiots when it comes to storing uh, the data they have. Oh, are we calling flurry idiots? No, but actually, you know, Ridge might totally be onto something where they're complete idiots uh, in terms of uh, (laughs) not really optimizing for the way they're storing their information. We're totally not getting sued for this one. Well, I'm saying it's it's possible. And uh, okay, so let me just go a step further. Rich, um, do you know if, for example, VCs didn't want to back them for another round. I mean, that's when you might start to be able to say, oh crap, you know, Yahoo saved their butts because no one else wanted to uh, give them some more venture money. Well, they took 12 and a half million last year, right? So that brings to the to to the VC uh, raised for Flurry to 60, over $66 million, which is a huge volume of venture capital mm-hmm. uh, by any measure. It's a lot of money. So they were faced, my sources told me, they were faced with uh, the prospect of, of going to the venture capitalists and signing away more percentages of their company uh-huh. and giving it to the venture capitalists or going for the debt loan. So both options kind of sucked, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, Flurry is, is, is really an incredible company. It's, a, it's an early pioneer in analytics. Mm-hmm. Yahoo is, is paying for that, that data, which is valuable. They can infuse that into their 800 million plus user stream uh, on the ad side. But the ad business that Flurry, you know, kind of tried to build up 2012, 2013, wasn't performing as well because, you know, analytics were being given away for free, at least the SDKs, right? So Mm -hmm. it it was a, uh, you know, a a grim kind of situation to be in. In terms of the percentage breakdowns after that uh, approximately 240 million is paid out and it's a cash and stock deal as I understand. Uh, there's really, uh, after the, the venture capitalists are paid off, they're first in line, there's how much equity is left. But uh, on the other hand, Flurry survives. So that's a good thing. Okay. So uh, do you know what, what happens now uh, internally? Uh, how do you think Flurry is going to get integrated with Yahoo? Have you ever talked to people that have s- sold their companies to Yahoo, Jordan? Actually, let's see. I've talked to Yahoo about a lot of the acquisitions they do. And for the most part, That's how they grow their talent. They hire and retain talent by making smaller acquisitions. But I don't think this was one of those deals, was it? It was more of a technology acquisition. Yeah, it's purely, purely they're they're paying purely again for for the data in Mm -hmm. those servers, and and that's consumer data on mobile devices, multiple mobile devices globally. So if you're a publisher or an ad ad uh, advertising agency and you want to advertise on mobile, that data is absolutely crucial. I mean, it has the precision, in lieu of cookies, right, of being able to track people down to their hair color, you know, shoe polish preferences, and you know what they ate for breakfast three days ago. <laughs> so, and with Yahoo's focus, like laser focus on mobile applications, I think that was a really important, maybe missing piece for them. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it's pretty logical. I mean, you you know what's going on, Jolie, and uh, yeah. I mean, I would say you're, you're absolutely correct on that. And I think uh, there, there's more traffic now coming to a lot of sites for mobile devices than from desktops. So. Honestly, if Yahoo continues to make a lot of acquisitions on mobile ads and mobile app usage, I would really not be surprised. There have been a lot of other indications about mobile first being the way to go, and uh, Yahoo should be going, you know, trying to get the best data possible. Uh, Facebook did a move like that with Onavo. Don't be surprised if Microsoft does more there and Google as well. Well, I think Google, they probably have the internal talent and analytics already because they've been working for so long on mobile technologies and deep learning. Probably, probably. Yeah. We'll see. Rich, before I let you go, I need to, I need to talk to you for five minutes about... Sure. I want to I take us over to the Middle East. Oh, God, yeah? Yeah, I do. I, well, you did this interview with Viber. We were talking about this. 400 million users, and they understand cultural paradigms outside the U.S. to the extent that they're being used for communicating in these war-torn areas. Who is using this tool? I have friends in, 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 the, in that 
part of uh, in that region of the world, both in Israel and in the Muslim world as well. And the people, I, my friends who are all young, late 20s, early 30s, uh, avid tech users, uh, engineers, uh, have told me, I've reached out and said, look, I, I was asking them, you know, how are you guys communicating where it's a dangerous game if, if, if your, uh, your communications are intercepted by your government, Syria or Iran, for example. It's like a life or death situation or a long prison sentence if you're not saying the right thing. So the people are telling me, uh, my sources and friends, that you know, the, the encryption on Viber is unparalleled. And that encryption, as the article pointed out, is directly related to Tom and Marco, the CEO's experience in the Israeli Defense Forces, where some of the best engineers and programmers uh, are applying their trade first before they, because it's compulsory, before they actually launch companies of their own. So people swear by it. I didn't really know that much about Viber, and I thought the usage base was $250 million until I heard back from them this morning in Israel, in, in Tel Aviv, that no, that number is 400 million. That's huge. Absolutely. Well, Rich, I, I want our listeners to f- be able to follow you because, man, you get the scoops. You know what's going on. Uh, what's your Twitter handle? It's at Arburn Riley. But let, and, me, let, let me just yeah, uh, yeah, go ahead. Point, Sorry. point out that uh, it's people like Jordan that I'm learning from every oh, day, our, our Venture Beat team. So it's an extraordinarily exciting uh, newsroom to be in because you're learning from a 365 degree perspective on everything that's going on tech wise. So it's exciting. Well, we learn a crap load from you, Rich. Yeah, well, I think uh, Jordan, because of your investigative st- skills, Rich, I think Jordan's become a real pit bull on the phone Arr! with some of his sources. I mean, he will come right out and say, hey, this is BS. I need you to tell me the truth. And I think that's a Rich Riley move. Classic Rich Riley. Well, Jordan's a New Yorker, right? He's a kid from Queens, the Ramones hometown, right? So I mean, right. he's got that going for him. So Rich, how do you spell that Twitter handle? R-B-Y-R-N-E-R-E-I-L-L-Y. Richard Byrne Riley, everybody. Thank you so much for bringing the burn. Hey, guys, it's my pleasure, and I uh, love you both, and uh, see you soon. We love the crap out of you, Rich. Adios, Rich. All right, peace. Now, everybody, we want to thank you sincerely for tuning in to another episode of What to Think, the podcast that tells you what to think. From VentureBeat and New Relic, I, Julie O'Dell, wish you a beautiful rest of your day. Bye. Bye.